Hey everyone, it's Corey McCarthy and welcome to a new episode. This is a very special episode. I had recently done an in-depth interview over Google Hangouts with Jay Leeson. Uh, Jay is one of my original clients, the Vegan Muscle Academy. Who recently got into amazing shape utilizing my science-backed programs and advice and competed in a men's physique contest as a drug-free vegan. I recently gave Jay a shout-out in a video sharing his progress. And people wanted to know more. This interview is the comprehensive answer to that request. It is almost an hour long, but it covers everything from training to cardio to nutrition to supplementation as well as dealing with cravings and calorie deficits, etc. We even discussed vegan activism. So. Grab a snack, a beverage, even a pen and a notepad, and get comfortable, and let's begin. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing really good, Corey. Thank you. Yeah, doing really good. Thank you. So? So I guess we're going to kick off the, I mean, your your physique changed drastically. Uh, do you mind, uh, I guess, going over a bit what you did uh, dietarily? I know you had mentioned that you followed my principles of keeping protein and fat the same and adjusting carbohydrates. Yeah, that's right. So when I started out, I um, I used the formulas that you had on the Vegan Muscle Academy to work mm -hmm. out exactly how many calories that I'd need and then how much protein, carbohydrates and fat. Um, then from that point on, initially I was looking at like bulking. That was my main goal to start with. So I did. I took that all into consideration and I'd done a 10% surplus and mm -hmm. um, kept all the macronutrients and calories exactly the same um, and was noticing my weight was dropping I, I, I'm not sure if you remember but I, uh, yeah, I remember that um, <laughs> what's happening so I think, and I think you said well everyone's different you know it's gonna make slight adjustments and it was at that point yeah. I was actually feeling much better for it um, mm -hmm. so my initial goal was to bulk but then I was looking in the mirror and I was starting to notice like I was starting to see a little bit more definition in my stomach and I was, you know, I was happy. Like, I thought, oh, this is really good. Um, and yeah, I think yeah, just, yeah. Who then said, well, you know, why not carry on? You know, you've got the summer coming up. Um, yeah, yeah. Stick with it and then and stay with the cut. And that's exactly what I did. And you it know? got you all the way to the, the contest, I suppose. I mean, yeah, I do remember that. I mean, that's the thing that I want, I try to impress upon members too, is that the guidelines of the nutrition program uh, they give out are just, they're, they're like a starting point. Like everyone is a little different. Everyone has different exertion. So like, you know, maybe I'll go to the gym and what I do, I consider pretty intense, but somebody else may be like, well, that's not intense enough. And maybe they're doing more cardio, maybe they have an active job. It's, it, this is why um, tweaking is so important because everyone is going to be different. And uh, you know, you have to find that sweet spot. But yeah, I do remember that. I remember thinking, yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're happy with where you are and you're feeling good, and your and summer's coming up. You might as well stick with it. And uh, what eventually? I mean, how far? Let's put it this way: How far did you take your calories down? Did you? Uh, how far did you keep tweaking your carbohydrates? Um, well, I didn't plan on doing this competition. It wasn't anything I'd like. When we started out in, in March, it wasn't something I thought. Oh, I want to compete in July. It wasn't even mm -hmm. on the radar. Um, so I was just content at the time, really, just getting ready for the summer and just sort of cutting and. And I was yeah, noticing my yeah. strength was going up, so I was, I was really happy. And it wasn't until um, a mate of mine, Shameless, he's uh, he does some um, coaching for, for bodybuilders and physique athletes, and um, he sort of said to me at the time, like, well, why don't you give this stuff a go, you know? Get yourself on stage. And this was nine weeks out from the competition. So I was a little bit hesitant to start with, but I thought, oh, well, what have I got to lose, you know? Like, I'll go up there, I'll give it my best shot, and... Um, so I decided at that point, from nine weeks out, I started sort of prepping and cutting my carbohydrates then. Um, I actually don't think I cut them for the first week. I think I waited till week eight. And then I just brought them down just very gradually, just each week. Um, I think it was something, uh, I think it was 25 grams cut down each week with a little bit yeah. of increased cardio. So I sort of was increasing my activity levels whilst bringing my carbohydrates down. Um, so the lowest I got my lowest I went on my my uh, carbs was 200 grams, which I think for a lot of people, especially bodybuilders and physique athletes, that's still like really higher. Yeah, so yeah, really, yeah. <laughs> so I was I was really happy with that because um, you know, I was I was still feeling like I had quite a bit of energy. It wasn't until the last week. There was a couple of days in the last week where I felt like I was a little bit getting a bit sluggish, but I mean. I know a lot of people, especially talking to other athletes backstage, 
uh, they were dragging their heels for like six to eight weeks, you know, they yeah, really yeah. had a hard time, really felt it really rough. So I was really happy that I was able to get on stage and really I experienced, say, like a couple of days, and even that weren't too bad, to be honest. It was just I wasn't on my usual sort of, sort of energetic self. So I was, that was a, um, that was quite rewarding knowing that I'd done it and not killed myself in the process. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, 25, the 25 grams uh, each, each week, week is, is sort of so what I kind of um, advise people anyway. Like I always uh, tell people gradually, don't just drastically <laughs> drop, your, drop your calories down. Um, it's a slow process. Even when you're just tweaking to kind of find where your sweet spot is. And then, you know, as you stagnate a bit more, you, you drop a bit more or you increase your activity or both, whichever works best for your body. But in the case of competition, obviously, um, you need more of a gradual, it's, it's gonna get pretty low. And this is why people do sort of, it's a lot different than just cutting down for summer because competition is gonna feel a lot more miserable because you have to get it quite a bit lower than you yeah. would if you're on the beach, for instance. Yeah, definitely, yeah. And I found, you, I was gonna say, I found the same as well for the cardio. Mm -hmm. I have exactly the same thing. I just very I, I took the same sort of principles that you were talking about in terms of diet, and I sort of applied that to the cardiovascular stuff as well. I didn't set out and do like you know an hour of walking or whatever it was. I started off really really gradually. So as the carbohydrates were coming down, I could find the sort of the sweet spot if you like, where I felt like at a nice level where I was wasn't too run down. I had a good amount of energy because I think one of the biggest things that um, a lot of people experience again is the fact that as the calories start to come down and they increase their cardio massively, then their weight training m suffers massively. I, I didn't. Yeah. I was hitting. I was hitting PRs in the last week on my shoulder press. So I was. For me, it was like this is really good. You know, I was quite. I was really happy with that. The fact that I was able to keep doing that. That's really interesting, actually, because a lot of people in those final weeks before competition, they have to train lighter because they can't. They can't handle the kind of weight. Their strength begins to decline. Uh, yeah. So that is really interesting that you said that. That's um, testament that you were doing it right. That you were doing something because you really you you got yourself down into great stage condition, and yet you felt strong into the end. That's that's incredible. Oh, thank you. Cheers. <laughs> did you throw? Did you? I mean, people are going to ask this. Did you do any cheat meals or cheat days or anything throughout the period? <laughs> no, not at all. No, once I. I was pretty, um, I, f I felt like I didn't need it, to be honest. Um, I'll tell you the only thing I did do, I did try and manipulate my carbohydrates and do a carb load. And I, mm. I, I practiced that about three weeks out from the competition. So um, I just, I went high on the carbohydrates just to see what, how my body reacted. Because I know that some physique athletes and bodybuilders will use that yeah. method to try and um, uh, replenish glycogen stores and you know so you get yeah. extra volume in the muscle um, and I, I tried it on three occasions actually so um, it would have been four weeks out I tried it then I tried it three weeks out then I tried it two weeks out and I didn't really notice much benefit and I think the reason was because my carbohydrates were pretty high I'm guessing my glycogen stores wouldn't have been that depleted to notice the difference so yeah. um, on competition day, instead I didn't mess about with that at all. I did, so the only uh, treat days you could say were there when I was experimenting with the higher carbs. Um, but I say it didn't really work. It, in, in, if anything, it took me probably three, four days just to get back to the condition that I was in. Yeah, uh, yeah. Do. So yeah, that, that definitely varies from person to person. And bear in mind that there are a lot of physique athletes too that are using drugs. And the drugs can help with nutrient repartitioning and everything and make those days where they do those big refeeds work just a little bit better for them right. uh, because their body will partition those nutrients in a particular way with the drugs that you just can't do without drugs. So, right. you know, yeah, it, it can vary, it can vary. And I, I know you said you, can, you did this completely natural, which I want to emphasize too because there are people that are accusing you of drug use or accusing me of telling you to do drugs, which is completely absurd. People are telling me to do drugs. I didn't see that one. <laughs> yeah, it's well. There, there was people saying like, oh, "Oh, he must have been on the gas." Uh, this was on. Um, this was uh, when I I did that video where I shared your before and after photo. 
Uh, and then there was on my on Facebook wall, someone asked if you were on drugs. Um, you know, it, so yeah, I mean, people thought that either you were taking them or that I was advising you to take them, which is <laughs> I will take drugs. So um, because what you did, I mean, it, it kind of smack. I mean, obviously genetics play a big part in that too, and and work ethic, but it does smash. Because I mean, you looked full, you looked lean. Um, you know, it, it kind of smashes what some of these guys like Jason Blaha, for instance, on YouTube, like to say that you can't have a lean, full look. Uh, with, you know, you look flat when you're a natural and you cut down your, you know, your body fat. Uh, how low did you go? Did you ever get tested? Uh, did you, or did you just go by the mirror? Yeah, I just went by the mirror. I don't know. I didn't get tested. No, I didn't. Okay. Yeah, I mean, because it look, it looked, you know, you look stage ready, which is which is great, which means that you had to be between six and eight percent body fat. I would say somewhere in that that ballpark. Um, and you said you felt great too, which is really really important. And yeah. uh, so, how how much cardio did you do, and how much uh, how many days did you train? So, how many days did you do cardio, or how many sessions a week, and how many days did you lift a week? Um, as from nine weeks out. I went. I upped it to four days a week weight training. Mm -hmm. um, my split then was like a, a push pull. So I done I push on a Monday, pull on a Tuesday. I had Wednesday off. Then I went back to push again on Thursday and a pull on a Friday and I had the weekend off. And that's how I rotated it. And I sort of tried to be a bit flexible with the, with the training there. So one of the pull sessions would be a little bit more higher volume, and then. The other session, like session B, would be a little bit more strength based. I try and keep my strength a little bit higher on them days. Okay. That, I felt that sort of gave me quite a good balance of getting the volume in. And also, what I found, if there were days that I was a little bit weaker on some of my strength days, mm -hmm. um, then I would revert to getting a bit more volume in, if that makes sense. So instead yeah. of like, um, you know, if I was like, if I had an off day where I just weights weren't, weren't there, I, I didn't have the strength. You know, try and sort of recover that by just lowering the weight a little bit and trying to get a bit of extra volume. Yeah, um, yeah. The cardio, from eight weeks out, I, I literally did a five-minute skipping. That's, that was my cardio. Oh, really? Really? <laughs> yeah, so I, done, I, I, done, and I increased it each week. So I've done uh, 40 seconds of uh, – sorry, 45 seconds of skipping, just mm -hmm. at a nice pace. And then I had 15 seconds rest, and I've done that, like, for five rounds. And then – as the as it went on, so the, the second week I done ten minutes for the full week every day. Then the third week fifteen minutes. So it sort of like went up slightly um, each week, um, and I capped that at thirty minutes. I didn't go any higher than thirty minutes each day. But I tried to keep it. What I wanted to do is I wanted to keep it the same every day, so I could monitor what how my body was reacting. Because yeah. if, if I do like you know, three days or, or I mix up the length of the cardio, then I'm not really going to know exactly what I was responding best to. So I decided that I was, whatever I did, I was going to do it every day and consistently every day. So that's what I decided to do. And with the cardio, did you do your cardio um, at the same, like after weight training, before weight training, on the days that you trained weights, or did you do it like separate, like morning and evening? Uh, yeah, I separated it. I've done it morning and evening. Yeah, yeah. Um, Generally, what I've done was I've done the cardio in the morning. Um, it did vary depending on like schedule and stuff like that. If I if I think if I knew I wouldn't have the time in the evening, um, then I'd do them both in the, in the morning. So, for example, but I always tried to do the cardio in a way that didn't affect the strength training. Exactly, exactly. Um, That's why I was asking that because it's something that I advise. Something the research shows that. If you're going to do cardio on the same day, I mean, optimally you should do them different days, but if you have to do them the same day for scheduling reasons or just because you want to do cardio every day, it's advisable to keep them, you know, on separate parts of the day, separate segments, so like morning and, and night or, you know, morning and evening kind of thing, as opposed to both in the evening or both in the morning. Uh, but, of course, you know, you have to do what your schedule allows too because, you know, uh, I'm sure you're the same boat as I. You have to, you know, we all have jobs, we all have obligations, family obligations, whatever else. So you kind of got to get it in any way you possibly can. So yeah, definitely. And I felt uh, skipping was a good um, like option for me as well because it's I wanted to pick something that I could do daily and something which wouldn't tax me too much as well. Yeah. So skipping. And you could like, do that at home too. I mean, like skipping is something you could do in your backyard, you could do in your living room or. Or whatever it's like I know sometimes and this sounds really funny because people have 
have seen me doing this in the house is like I'll run in place, I'll jog in place, or I'll yeah. do sprints in place, and then I'll take rest. So I'll do intervals at in my house. That way, you know, it saves me having to go to a gym that day or that morning. Because sometimes the gym, you just don't feel like getting up at six in the morning and going to the gym. So getting up and then going into your living room or in your bedroom and just doing some in place sprints with rest periods, intervals, you know, you can get that done and knock that out, and it's right there in, in your house. So. Definitely, yeah, and I found it was a good way as well to, um, I, I'd put my headphones in, sometimes I'd listen to a bit of music, sometimes I'd listen to, you know, just like podcasts or something like that, so it was, I didn't feel like it was like wasted time, I think sometimes like, yeah. if you feel like you've got to go to the gym just for cardio, then you've got your travelling there and all that sort of stuff, so it was just it was convenient for me just to put some headphones in and then just and get my cardio done that way. And did you take any supplements during this? Like, did you use like creatine or uh, you know multivitamins? Uh, what did you take? Uh, I took creatine, um, beta alanine, and uh, BCAAs. Okay, okay, the things that I recommend actually, they're all supported by research, so those which, are all really good. Which again, Corey, I, I got off from from listening to your your um, stuff on the Vegan Muscle Academy. Before that, I wasn't taking anything, so. Yeah, it's it down to you on that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's the thing. People, there there are people that say supplements are useless. And there are people actually who don't respond to supplements. Like, well, I mean, aside from things you need, like B12 or whatever else. But, like, there are people who just simply do not respond to creatine. They're, like, in a 5% responder group. And then there's people who respond, like, 45%. There's, like, the big responders, the high responders. And, and well, none of these will give anyone steroid-like gains. It is that little extra edge, and so if you are a responder or you notice the difference between when you're using it and when you're not using it, or even just the placebo effect that allows you to train harder because of the placebo effect, that's worth it. I mean, I mean, if you have the money to spend. I don't want people spending money on supplements if they don't have the money, but things like beta alanine, things like creatine, things like um, you know uh, protein powders and BCAAs, these things are demonstrated in research to be effective, and, and BCAAs especially – uh, for vegans, and because uh, that I elaborated that with research also in the uh, in the VMA group, you can find that in uh, in some of the past Q and A's I've talked about the benefits of uh, of BCAAs and EAAs uh, because um, it can enhance protein synthesis and it can actually double uh, the protein synthesis, especially in vegans. It's actually something in vegans and vegetarians uh, show positive benefit in the research, and the same thing with uh, creatine. So these things are, I mean, if you want to spend money, but there are purists out there who get on me. I have people get on me and troll me for recommending supplements, but it's not like I recommend all supplements. I just, you know, you, you got to be selective of the ones that, you know, the research is favorable toward. That's the thing. It's all about, you know, not blowing your money, looking at what's favorable and what's not. You know, there are many things like trivial stressors that just don't work. Like the research is not favorable on it. Uh, or testosterone boosters in general. They're bullshit, generally. So, um, yeah, that's why those things aren't recommended by me. Uh, so yeah, that, that's you did a really great job. I mean, you really, you know, you knocked out that physique. I mean, you really did, and and that's very inspiring. I thought it'd be very inspiring to uh, the people in the academy as well. Um, so, how much sleep did you average in a night? Did you did you get like six to eight hours? Did you get less, more? My my sleep is one of the things I really like, struggle with quite a bit. I don't get a lot of sleep at all. Um, I um. I work in a gym, and I, do, I used to do like classes as well, mm -hmm. uh, uh, quite early. So a lot of the time, I'd have to be up at five o'clock in the morning, and um, sometimes I just I just struggle to get get to sleep at night. And uh, so sometimes I won't be getting in bed till midnight, and then having like four and a half hours sleep. So really not not ideal at all. But for, that's one of the things I think like I'm trying to be a little bit more sort of conscious of really because. Um, yeah. It's like a lot of things. I think like my mind was quite active, and then it doesn't help like if you're on your phone or then you know you're on the computer or something. And then yeah, you're like, yeah. You know, doing overtime, so that's something I'm really trying to focus in on because I think that that will make a, a big difference as well. Well, yeah, well, because the blue light from the phone has been shown at least a, a bit. I mean, it's not like a, a significant amount, but it has been shown to some degree to disrupt um, your your body's ability to fall asleep, it, 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 it screws with the hormones and the chemicals in your brain. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, like, it's often advised that if you want to get a good night's sleep, you should, you know, switch off, like, blue lights or stop looking at computer screens and everything at least a couple hours before you go to bed. Yeah. And uh, 
people are going to ask this. So what can you walk us through a general day of eating, like what you'd have for breakfast, lunch, for dinner, um, basically how you made your meal plan work? Right. Okay. Well, I, don't, I followed sort of an intermittent uh, fasting all, okay. the, all the way through. So um, I generally, whatever time I woke up from, I'd normally wait at least eight hours um, as a sort of general guideline. So I'd wait about eight hours before I ate anything. Um, my training as well, I would do fasted. So oh, my, I'd normally train about half 11, 12 o'clock, like midday. Mm -hmm. um, and then once I finish my training, then I'd normally break my fast with you know, whatever meal I was going to have, and that, it would vary from from day to day because um, it just I just generally sort of mix it up a little bit. But it could be something like I might have porridge, um, some sort of porridge, or I might or I might even have something which is like an evening meal, sort of you know, like I might have some like tofu, um, mm. lentils, beans. Some, you know, it would vary from day to day. I, I mean, if anyone wanted to have a look at what I ate. I mean, I'm on my fitness pal and I track I track all my food on there. So if people did want to add me on there and have a look, like I've got all my foods laid out. But um I say it would I, I, I wouldn't necessarily have like a set thing. Even when you look on my fitness pal you'll see like my lunch might be the, the same, but I wouldn't necessarily have it in that order. I just it was just more because it was easy to load onto the phone that way. So I just once I worked out what I was going to have for the day, I didn't care at what point I had it. As long as I fit it in somehow, I wasn't worried necessarily about nutrient timing. I had something yeah. usually after training, and then I'd, I'd try and save the majority of my calories for the evening. Um, sometimes, like literally right before bed, I'd be finishing like a huge meal, um, and then I'd go to bed. So my, my view on it was like what you, you say in the Muscle Academy is that it, it really isn't a factor uh, as long as you look at the whole 24 hour period precisely, uh, precisely, precisely. That's, gonna, that's the most important thing so I'd just be really particular with the carb, uh, with the sorry, the macronutrients just to make sure I hit them um, just for my yeah. peace of mind so I knew what was working and what wasn't and where my body was at so I'd try and keep that as consistent as I could like within 5 grams of my of my target, I wouldn't try and go either side of that. I try and stick to as precise as I can. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's general things like you know beans, lentils, rice. I'd have porridge, berries, um, also you know, yeah. uh, bananas, uh, apples, things like that. So, did you get cravings? And if you did, what? How did you handle the cravings? Because this is a question people ask all the time. It's like, I'm trying to cut it, you know, even in a modest deficit, and I'm getting these massive cravings. Uh, or I'm really hungry, what do you advise? I'm just curious how you handled that. Well, I, I didn't experience it at all on the car, and I think the reason was, because I had a, something I was working towards, I had this day, it, that really helped me to focus. I think yeah. a lot, if you haven't got something like that, there is the tendency to let like that come in. Let, you know, If you get a craving, you tend to sort of create, you know, fall into it, and before you know it, you've, you know, you've messed up the, the nutri uh, nutrition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think because I had a, a date in mind, that kept me really focused. I am mm -hmm. starting to notice it a little bit now, post-show, which I think is pretty common. That's normal. That's normal. That's normal. In <laughs> fact, but what you want to be careful of, and this is something I don't really talk about in the academy, only because um, I'm like, you know, I don't really, we, I, I mean, I'm not really, I guess a lot of the people in the academy aren't really trying to compete. So it's not like a, and, and I also don't really advise people trying to get to competition weight and remaining there either. And that is that when you come out of a show, you don't just want to like just gorge. You just don't want to. You don't want to create some kind of an eating disorder. You know, you don't want to just completely blow yourself up. I mean, I've heard stories of people coming out of shows. Again, this is just stories, but where they have to cut their shoes off because they the, their sodium intake and everything just goes through the roof, and they gorge, 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 and they just retain all this water rate is burst in water weight. Now, again, those are stories that could be a bit exaggerated, but, and I've never competed myself, but I could see it happening when you have been depleting and depleting and depleting, and then suddenly, boom, you just like load up on junky foods and French fries and things. Yeah. I can see where that could possibly happen, you know, because you just go wild. Yeah. Uh, and you can also just feel sick as well, because your body isn't, hasn't been used to eating like that, and suddenly you just lay it in like that. So, yeah, it's... I've, well, I've had a, so, so post post show, I've had a few days where I've, I've 
I've not necessarily tracked my food. I've allowed myself yeah. to eat, but I, on the whole, I've pretty much kept it like in check, you know. So I had the odd day, and then then I'll settle, and then I'm okay again. Yeah. Yeah. And how was how was your mood? Did you notice anything about your mood that you didn't like? Uh, was your mood pretty consistent? Uh, did you feel uplifted, or did you feel down? Um, not really. No, there was. I mean, you do. You know, you do find that you're gonna, um, yeah. Certain some there are certain times when you're you're feeling a little bit like lethargic, you know. But yeah. it weren't so bad. It weren't it weren't really terrible. I mean, um, I was noticing that towards the end, the last few weeks, I was sort of dragging myself a little bit. You know, I still I still felt good in myself, but just. Um, I had good, a good amount of energy for my training, but then outside of that, I felt like I was sitting down more than I would normally. You know? Yeah. Uh, if, I, if there was an opportunity to sit down, I was sitting down. <laughs> so That's it wasn't, normal. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't ideal the last couple of weeks, really, in all honesty. But at the same time, I didn't feel terrible. I didn't feel like I've got to stop this or anything like that. It, just, it was just a few occasions, and you know, for the most part, I felt, I felt fine. Uh, my mood mood was fine again. You know, I felt good. You do get a little bit tetchy when meal time's coming up. I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I, I know that for a fact. Yeah, that, that that's what, what you're describing is normal. As you begin to get close to a show, it's going to happen. I mean, um, it's just that some people start having wild mood swings, like they get kind of aggressive. Um, you know, um, they uh, they they take it out on their loved ones, which is never a good thing. You know, and and a lot of times people's wives or girlfriends or family has to get used to the fact, okay, yeah, he's pre-contest right now. He's going to be a bit, you know, <laughs> on edge, I suppose is the word for it. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it can happen, and it can it can vary from person to person. Uh, did you rely on coffee at all? I did use coffee, yeah. In, yeah. The, in the fasting period, I used coffee, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's, 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 pretty, uh, that's pretty normal, I'd say. Like, I mean, even me, I wake up in the morning, I have some coffee. I've kind of quit the pre-workout coffee, but you know, I still, I still have coffee during the fasted period because it is, uh, it does blunt hunger. Uh, for those who are interested in intermittent fasting, coffee does blunt hunger, uh, and um, you know, and it can slightly raise the metabolism, and it has been shown to uh, boost strength in the training. I'm going to see if anyone's asked any questions in the uh, comments area. Oh, okay. Bill is asking, uh, what is Jay's my fitness pal name? So that he can look at at your diet. Uh, it's Jay Leeson one. Just the okay. Jay Leeson one. Did you get that? Did you get that, Bill? All right. So I don't think there's any more questions from people here in the sidebar. Um, but uh, is there anything you want to add? Like you want to say that maybe we haven't covered, we haven't talked about when it came to, uh, you know, uh, your tri diet training, anything. The only thing I was going to mention about the, um, you were saying about some tips for people for cravings, sorry, and I, I forgot to mention this. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Um, one of the things I sort of tried to do was, um, I think intermittent fasting is a really good way of doing that, it, it, especially if you know, I mean, work, I work in a gym as well, and when I sort of speak to people, when I ask about the times they tend to overeat, it's normally in the evening time. Yeah. Uh, Tends to be like when you know you've done you've been to work, sitting down, watching telly, and then that's when all the snacks and that start to come out. So yeah. I would say like as a if if you're the type of person that struggles like that, then to make sure you do some sort of intermittent fasting, because then that window, um, it's your eating window shorten, and then you now allow yourself to have them meals in the, the big meals, and you'll feel like a bit a bit more. Um, satisfied. You won't have to. If you have throughout the day, then you've got less calories to play with at the time when you're most likely to want to sort of snack on stuff. And um, yeah, I'd also say like uh, have some frozen fruit as well. So that was another thing I used during the prep. I used to, I bought these um, uh, Alpro um, like they're top yogurts, Alpro uh, vegan friendly yogurts. Mm -hmm. And um, what I would do with them is I'd mix in some frozen fruit. And so I think. The fact that it's frozen, you get the sweetness of like you feel like you're having a nice dessert, and also it sort of slows your eating down a little bit because it's frozen as well, so you're not sort of like yeah. shoving it in. Um, yeah, that's probably what I'd say. I've, I have something in there that's a little bit sweet that sort of satisfies that sweet tooth in you. Um, yeah. Um, and also, like I say, 
having the majority of your food of, of an evening just seems to stop that completely. And it kept me active during the day as well. Like when I, if I didn't have any food, I'd sort of feel to myself feel like um, I didn't have to worry about carrying food with me, prepping food or anything like that. So it kept my day, first part of my day, pretty active. And I think a lot of people, if you're working during the day, if you've got like normal shifts that you work, then you're busy at work anyway. So yeah, it just seemed yeah. ideal for me. It fit nicely, you know. Yeah, that's the same reason I do it, IF. And uh, I mean, again, I'm, I'm not where I, I want to emphasize to any of the viewers here is that it's not that we're saying that IF is the magical way, but it, it, some people, these are the benefits they notice. And it's when I'm at, what he's talking about, I notice as well, is that when I put off my meals to like starting at 2 p.m., for instance, it's the same thing. You have that period of the day, like eight hours where you're just not eating. And coffee helps you get through that because it's an appetite suppressant. And then you basically take, even in a deficit, you're taking what could be 2,500 calories or something, and you're cramming it into eight hours' time um, at the end of the day. And uh, and that makes makes it easier because it makes it feel like, because it's less time for all that calories that you normally would put over the course of, like, say, 12 hours, it just yeah. makes it feel like there's more food. And um, the same thing we say about fruit and stuff, too, is that something I've found is that sometimes I will drop uh, bananas. I'll stop eating bananas, and I'll use, like, plums or apples. For instance, like... Three bananas has the carbohydrate equivalent of nine plums. Right. And plums are really high in fiber. So let's say you're just feeling particularly hungry that day. I don't particularly find personally that bananas satiate me very much. So if I swap the bananas for nine plums, because plums are like a rock fruit, that <laughs> that just kind of whole it sits in you and it sits in you. And you feel like you had a bigger meal than you really did because of the fiber. So these are other tips people can use too to help keep you on track. Um, fruit is a great way to get a sweet taste in your mouth. Fill yourself up because of the fiber and not wreck your diet. Yeah. Um, you can thin your macronutrient, you know, uh, set up. So yeah. that's, that's I yeah. Look, I also found that as well, just um, in terms of my other food choices as well. So I'd go for things like a lot of broccoli and uh, mushrooms and yeah. stuff like that. It sort of helped to bulk out the meal, made it a much bigger meal. And then all of a sudden, I've got a huge plate of food. Yeah. And calories, you know, if the calories aren't quite that, well, they're not high at all. So it, that just worked out quite nicely as well, doing it that way. Did you use a protein powder of any kind, like a particular brand you want to recommend to people, or did you customize, like, my protein or something? Um, I did use one, actually, yeah. Um, I didn't make a massive habit of it. It was just the, the protein powders were good for the days where I just needed to get that protein up hit my target so yeah I usually have that if I was going to have it it was usually at the end of the day just mm -hmm. to match everything in and, and get everything like to the level so that the, actually that and the, the three sort of food items that I sort of um, had pretty much throughout was uh, I had the protein powder um, mm -hmm. almonds and I did use bananas as well and I do the reason I used them three things was because I could control the macronutrients of them quite well. So if I had 40 grams of carbohydrates to hit, I would work it out, I'd weigh the banana and work out where my 40 grams was, and that would go in a blender. And the same for the, the almonds and the same for the protein shake. There wasn't a crossover, or there's not much of a crossover. So like obviously your nuts haven't got a higher amount of carbohydrates in than the same. Exactly. Way. I, I was able to use them three ingredients to make up my final meal. If I was short on anything, then I'd use them, manipulate them to hit my target. So pretty much every day on the prep, um, I could get really close to my, my macronutrients. So, that was so do you think you'll you think you'll ever compete again, or is that like a one-time thing you've done it, you tried it out, maybe you didn't like it? No, I really, I, I tell you, I really enjoyed it, and I, I actually I had a bit of a the post competition blues, I guess, because um, <laughs> I came, I, I had the competition, I didn't place, but like the whole like, day was a really cool day because I had my mum, my, my dad there, my sister, I had um, my mate Seamus, he, my other mate uh, Dave, who was competing as well, he was competing in the uh, bodybuilding category. So, mm -hmm. and obviously f all friends and family. So it was a really nice atmosphere. It was like, it was a nice feeling to get up there and, you know, have people sort of cheer you on and you know so it's a really cool day and then um then the following day you have something to eat and you pig out and then i was like 
yeah. but I want to do it again, you know. So, so day two after the competition, I found another competition which was, is in eight weeks' time, and I thought, well, I'm going to do that. But um, I've since decided I'm going to have a little bit of a rest from it, and I'm, yeah, I, I sort of, I, I sort of think to myself, well, what could I improve in, in eight weeks? I mean, it's not going to be dramatically different. So yeah, exactly. I've decided I will do it again, but next year I'm hoping that if, in a year's time I can sort of improve quite drastically again. And like we can see like a real progression from where I was this year. Yeah, well this will give you a year to actually build up any body parts you feel that need to be built up. You know, maybe if, you're, if you feel like your arms need to be bigger or your delts need to be bigger or, you know, this is where you can sit back, you can look at yourself in the mirror, self-critique. Um, you can even go into the VMA forum and get critiques there. And uh, just find the spots you think and, and others seem to tell you that could use more enhancement. Just to not necessarily because maybe they're they're bad, but because just it'll just add to your physique. It'll exaggerate your physique more. And you know you have a good year to do that. You could add you know a good few pounds of muscle, get yourself leaned up, and get back on stage. Because one thing I like to emphasize is that people might think, oh, you know, a few pounds of muscle isn't a lot, but on a lean body, a few pounds of muscle is going to show up. I mean, people will notice that extra muscle. Um, so, you know, people shouldn't scoff at even one or two pounds of added muscle because it will show up. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, it, it's, it's definitely worth it. In a year's time, you could, you could conceivably put on a couple pounds of muscle, a few pounds of muscle, um, and, uh, you know, and depending on your level of experience, maybe even more, depending on genetics, maybe even a little more, uh, and then you get yourself leaned up for the show. So, yeah, I mean, a year's a good time to wait. Um, you know, and, and if you really just want to do it again, you're hankering to do it again, you could just, you know, just cut down again back to where you want to be and do a competition in like, you know, a few months or whatever. Whatever you'd want to do. You know, it's really, it's up to you. Depends on what you want to bring to stage next. That's really what it comes down to. Yeah, definitely. I think for me as well, I think it's, um, I want to sort of stay a fairly good body fat percentage as well. For I don't want to sort of go off and get too heavy and then have to cut back and go for yeah. a really heavy diet. So, I'm going to stay, I'm going to increase the calories very gradually, put on a bit of size, and then a, a similar sort of approach as, as I've done before, you know, just then again bring it down nice and slight. So it's not a drastic big 12, 15 week cut. I want to try and keep it yeah. like in the eight to nine week yeah. range to cut in. Yeah. Well, that's the thing you don't need, and I don't even advise massive bulking, you know, faces. There's some people that like they use bulking as an excuse to have an eating disorder. So it's like, you know, I just advise a slight, you know, surplus, just enough to get you to grow muscle. Because there comes a point where they even show this in research. And again, this is in the academy. I talked about this, the research on this, where after a point, you're just going to accumulate way more fat than you will muscle. And that's not going to do you any favors. It's not going to do your health any favors. It's not going to do your physique any favors. And it's just going to be more work for you in the back end having to get rid of that. So it's not really worth it to do these this big, disastrous bulks. No, that's right, yeah. So Bill's asking another question. He said, um, uh, he's asking your country. Obviously, you're in the UK. Uh, but he says, I can't seem to find him on Jay Leeson 1 on my fitness pal. If he could tell me what country, that may not, that may help. He's not sure. Uh, Bill, he's in the UK, so maybe that will help. Should be Jay Leeson 1. I, can, I might have to double check. I'm sure, certain it's Jay Leeson 1. Uh, and Bill, he's asking where he can see photos of you. Um, Jay, do you have an Instagram? Do you have a... Uh... Yeah, I do, yeah. It's, in fact, actually, I'll tell you what, I might have that around the wrong way, so you might be right. I think it's... Um, let me. I've just got my phone here. One second, let me just quickly check. I think sure. my, in, my Instagram might be Jay Leeson1. Let's have a look. Sorry, I should know this. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> yeah, my, my sorry, my Instagram is Jay Leeson1, and my fitness pal is Jay Leeson. So that should... Clear that up. Sorry. Okay, Bill. So it's Jay Leeson for his uh, My Fitness Pal. And he's in the UK. And it's Jay Leeson 1 for his Instagram. That's what he said. And um, also, you can go to my Facebook wall. I'm, on my Facebook, I shared a progression of his uh, of his before, middle, and after. And I'll be likely putting that up as the thumbnail for this video as well when it's in the members area. So you can find it there too. Uh, and if you check out my recent video uh, called um, I Started Eating Meat Again, which is not about me, by the way. <laughs> that was just basically clickbait. <laughs> but in the middle of the video, I also share his progress. There's some some photos in there as well in that video. And that was like a couple videos ago. So you can check all those locations out and find photographs of Jay. And, and I'm, I'm just going to give you a heads up. It's it, He made an incredible transformation. It's a really 
incredible transformation. It definitely caught attention. And it got people throwing out the steroid accusations. So you know when you get that, that you're yeah. doing something right. Because people make those accusations when you look like what they perceive as something impossible, you know, um, naturally. Well, that's so, one of the things uh, um, sort of, uh, I suppose, when I decided to do this competition, one of my mates, Seamus, who's convincing me to do it, was, uh, you know, about that, you know, going into something like this and just show people what's possible. You know, I think for a lot of people, they they tend to think that if you're a vegan, you, you're not going to be able to be yeah. in any way, shape or form and that you have to sacrifice um, not just, you know, a lot of people believe it for some reason that they're going to have to sacrifice their health, but also their performance, their athletic performance, the amount of muscle they can um, build and retain. So like, that's one of the driving forces really, like every workout I would think to myself about that and try and um, just put it out there to people because I think the more vegans there are that are out there that are doing, um, being a good representative of, of sort of the vegan exactly. community movement, then the more people are going to be open to that, the idea of considering it, you know, I think that's the main thing, I, I wanted people to I'm, I'm not one of these people to try and sort of push it on people. Mm -hmm. Like, um, I try not to even mention it too much, like, because I don't want to be like the annoying vegan that everyone goes, oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> so, but um, I want it. I want it to be like when people see me, they ask questions about, oh, well, okay, how did you do that? And then I can say to them, oh, I was a vegan. Then, the, then I think that is more impactful than trying to push it on people or be really pushy sometimes. So it's a case of like what condition can I get in and um, and then from there like being able to then use that as a platform to promote like veganism. You know, precisely, show precisely. They can they can do it if they want to. It's just a ch then it comes down to a choice, you know, really. Then yeah. if people want to do it, then they know it's a possibility. And I'm only just one example one little example and I'm not you know obviously I'm not like um, there's other guys out there really high level, you know, so it, I think it's nice for people to see people they know as well that, that do it, you know, so yeah. in, your, in your community, like if you've got a little reach within your little community, like I work in a gym, so I've got like people who are coming to a gym and I can sort of start to explain that to them. Then that, oh, good, good. So people uh, approached you, know. you, people actually approached you about being a vegan. Yeah, yeah, I've had that, yeah. Yeah, I've done, I've, I've I've um, explained everything that I've gone through, you know, like in terms of like how to set it up, and you know what what sort of foods to go for, and things like that. So, yeah, that I'm finding that's more common. Um, I'm getting people coming to me now, especially like if I've like added like people as a result of your video, and then people are asking me questions on Instagram, like private messaging me. So I'm I'm able to sort of filter it down to people that way, you know. So it's yeah. um, a form of like activism, I guess, if you like. Dude. It is a form of activism. People think that the only way you can be an activist is to get out there to rallies, but there are other forms of activism, like representing, like leading by example, representing a community in a way that makes people go, whoa, you know, interesting. You actually did, okay. that kind of thing actually is a form of activism too, because there are people who may not be moved by these vegan rallies, these vegan protests. They may just you know, frankly, like some of these people, they might be like, oh, just shut up, shut up, I don't want to hear this. You know, you're, you're, you're infringing upon my rights to do this or that. But maybe they're bodybuilders or something or they're fitness uh, enthusiasts and they see somebody getting a physique that they wish they had or a physique like their own and they go, wait a second here. So he did this as a vegan, you know, and I do love animals and I do love the, the planet and I'd like to make a difference, you know, but I was afraid that I wouldn't be able to do that without eating meat or dairy or, an, or other animal products. And, uh, you know, this is a way to prove that, you know, that you don't need need those things. And then this is another reason why I don't emphasize steroids because the next excuse people use is, oh, well, you know, a vegan can do that, but a vegan requires drugs, you know? So when you have vegans out there that are doing this, that are achieving these athletic feats or these physique feats, and they're doing it without the use of performance enhancement drugs, it sh sh shoots that, that complete argument down. <laughs> I think it's a great thing too, because again, it's good for the movement to have all kinds of people. I mean, obviously we have guys like Barney Duplessis who are clearly using performance enhancement drugs, but you know, then we have guys like you that aren't. So this goes to show that 
you know, vegans can do it all. They can do any of this. They, they don't, there's no, there's no like we can do it, but we need X, Y, or Z to make it happen. And I think so, as well, it's important for the, like you're saying there, to be a scope of, of different approaches for people because, um, you know, everyone, like you say, is going to react differently to certain things. I know for me personally, like a, um, a protest or I've seen videos of, you know, on YouTube of people approaching people in the streets and um, being almost to the point confrontational with yeah. people who are wearing, say, like fur or something like that. Um, and I understand, like, what they're doing, but for me personally, that wouldn't, if I was the person being approached in that way, it wouldn't, that wouldn't be the driving force for me to turn to veganism. But that's just me personally. So everybody's going to have their different, what they react exactly. well to. And so that is good. It's good that everyone's doing that, you know. So like um, the, the YouTube channels, like, like what you're doing with your YouTube channel and putting out this, like, you know, the science-based stuff. Like there's a lot of, like, people in the fitness community, like in recent years, it's moving towards that, you know. People want, they don't want the bro science now. People want the science behind it. So it's good that there's people like you out there that are putting out good information, quality information that people can um, listen to, understand and like, educate themselves on. But, um, and then there's other people, you know, out there like uh, Vegan Games, who's a bit more like, you know... He's aggressive, got, yeah. <laughs> he's got a different approach. But again, I think all of it works depending on the person and what they're looking for. You know, if they're looking, exactly. if they're looking for somebody who wants, you know, who gives good scientific information about nutrition, diet and stuff like that, then obviously they've got you there. And there's loads of other di different people. John Venus does a good job as well with his channel. Like, um, you know, he does... Um, like vlogs and stuff like that so it's, i think it's just finding what works like for you if you're if somebody's w watching this video now and they're thinking about sort of delving into sort of being a vegan and they're not too sure then like, i would say like go and listen and watch and find someone that resonates with you find find a channel that sort of when you listen to it instantly you sort of feel like drawn to watch it you know and that's and then use that as your your motivation to you know, to try it and give it a go. Precisely, precisely. Well, let me see if there's any more questions from, uh, um, oh, yeah, he's, so Bill's saying, uh, he got it, it's Jay Leeson, uh, my fitness pal in the UK. Holy crap, great photos on Instagram. Uh, what a great example, Jay, is to the vegan community. Um, yeah, uh, advocating a meat-free way of building muscle and getting shredded. So there you go. You got a, <laughs> you got a, you got a fan here going on. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So there you go. <laughs> so, um, yeah, well, I, I don't have any more questions. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add. My computer's probably going to drop off in a few minutes. So um, we can, we, we've been going for about an hour. So is there anything you want to, any closing words you want to provide? Uh, well, not just to thank you, Corey, really, because, I mean, like, you were the catalyst for this, uh, the whole the whole start of this, you know. So big thank you to you, like, for what you're doing Um with the Vegan Muscle Academy and also like with your YouTube channel, like putting that stuff out there because I think if it, it's people like yourself who are doing that, that you know, it's getting that message out. I know you're reaching a lot of different people and um, I think it's really cool. Like, I'm, I'm hoping to do something myself, you know, that's what I, I want to move towards sort of doing. I'm, I've done a few little videos on YouTube, but you know, I want to start doing that. I want to start trying to inspire people because I think, like I said before, I think the more people that are out there that are doing it, the more impact it's going to have, like in the long term. You should, you should, and and obviously too, I will, I will promote your channel. Oh, uh, you get you. some material up there, you get it going. I I will pass people your way and get you some subscribers, so you can get that message and snowball. Because really, with YouTube, it's a it's a snowball effect. It it, it, it at first it might seem really slow. This is where people tend to quit and stop. But you know, back I remember back when I was like releasing videos and I wouldn't have more than fifty to hundred views tops, sometimes less than that. You know, and then you'd go for a few months and it would happen like this and it would happen like this. But eventually, you know, somebody like Vegan Gaines helped me out. Like he uh, he gave me a um, – he liked some of my videos, which got me exposure. And uh, because of that, I began it began a snowball effect. Mm -hmm. And, like, from there, it was just a growth, 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 growth. And before you know it, your message is being heard by numerous people. Your old videos are being watched now by people who might have missed them before. And uh, that's how it works. But – you know, that's part of the thing about pushing that message and, and, and believing the message is that you do it whether or not people are listening yet anyway, because someday people probably will be. So I really do hope you do take up, because YouTube's a great platform for this now. 
Excellent. Yeah. I, in fact, it's uh, funny you say. I um I found your channel through Vegan Gun. So yeah. I, I oh, see, okay. I see that he liked your video, and then I watched it, and then and here we are. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's how it works. That's it. That's how we pay it forward, I suppose. Like you know. There, there's always somebody who sort of helps the other channel out and that channel grows and that channel then helps somebody else out. It's just paying it forward essentially is how it works. And, uh, and by no means is my channel large. I mean, John Venus has now got about 80,000. And I remember about a year or so back, about a year and a half ago, he was up around 20,000, you know, and, uh, you know, the, it just, it just, you never know. There's something that will catalyze that growth again and again and again and again and again. And granted, drama videos do help. <laughs> <laughs> you know, every time I do a drama video, I get more views on my videos than I do. But I only do them when I have something relevant to create drama for. I don't do it for drama's sake. So, but um, anyway, well, it was great talking with you, Jay. And uh, let me see this. Let me check one more time. So, there's any more questions from people? I don't see anything more. So, um, with that, I guess we'll sign off. And uh, it was great talking with you. And I hope to see your channel. And I. I do want to add that everyone bear in mind that, yeah, I mean, he did use the nutrition pro uh, programs that are in the academy, but he had to put in a lot of work for that and a lot of time. It takes time. It takes work. It takes consistency and dedication. And, uh, you know, information, well, the information can help you reach your goal, but you have to apply it. You have to be willing to apply it. And, uh, and Jay did. So when you have the application, you have the information, you marry the two things, you get the results. So... You need to be commended for your efforts, Jay, because that, that took four months. That was a four-month trans, uh, transformation. Oh, lovely. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Take care. Take care, Corey. Speak to you soon. And there you have it. If you've enjoyed this interview, please show your appreciation by giving this video a like, even sharing it. If you'd like to have access to the precise programs and information that got Jay into his contest shape, then sign up for the Vegan Muscle Academy today. Just go to veganmuscleacademy.com forward slash join dash now. The growing body of content within its walls is entirely supported by research, no bro science. And there is even a members forum, a community where you can interact with me and other members to ensure you're getting the most from the service. Anyhow, don't forget to subscribe to this channel to keep on top of regular updates. Also, check out Jay on Instagram. I've linked that in the description below. Otherwise, till next time, my friends.